Okay, welcome everybody uh, to the February 21st board meeting of Pajaro Valley Unified School District. It's 6.08 p.m. I'm uh, Leslie DeRose, the board president, and um, we are about to adjourn to closed session unless we have speakers to our closed session agenda. We have none. And seeing no speakers, we'll go ahead and adjourn and we'll be back at 7 p.m. for our open session. Thank you. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, this is the PVUSD board meeting of February 21st, 2018. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Aptos High for hosting us here in their beautiful Performing Arts Center. And it's um, nice to see um, those who came out to see us to come and um, join us for the meeting. We are gonna go ahead and start with our Pledge of Allegiance and Vice President Orozco has agreed to lead us in that. Thank you. I'll speak. All rise. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So again, I just wanted to welcome everybody. I know it might be a little chilly in here. Um, I think they're used to people performing under hot lights in this room, so that would make sense. Um, and who knows, it's, it could get there, right? Um, so again, wanted to welcome everybody. And um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to um, mention, you know, there's a tragedy that happened in Florida last week that is, uh, I'm sure weighing heavy on everybody's minds, and um, we're all thinking of our um, our education colleagues across the nation, um, our families who um, this is very close to. It's close to us. It's close to everybody who's a part of a school, a part of a, a of education at any level. So I'd like to ask that we all give just a few um, moments of silence um, in memory of the uh, victims, their families, and communities. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to go to 3.3, .3 and that's superintendent's comments. Dr. Rodriguez. Okay. Yes. I can't hear you. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Um, if anybody uh, in the audience needs translation for this board meeting, you can see Virginia over here. She's our district translator, and she does have equipment uh, to make it convenient for um, those who were prefer to uh, listen in Spanish. And that's Virginia right there. Thank you. Um, buenas uh, tardes. Um, queríamos informarles que tenemos la traductora que está disponible si alguien ocupa traducción esta noche. Y está, uh, es el, si van Virginia, si ocupan el equipo, pueden pasar con ella. Okay. Well, good evening. I want to invite all the staff, parents, and community to our 2018 PVUSD Parent Conference on this Saturday. We will start the event, which will be held at Watsonville High School at 8 a.m. for breakfast and registration. I will welcome the families to the event at the Mellow Center, followed by our keynote speaker at 8.45 a.m. So, buenas tardes. Quiero invitar a todo el personal, padres y comunidad, a nuestra conferencia de padres de 2018 de PVUSD este sábado. Vamos a comenzar el evento que se va a llevar a cabo en la secundaria de Watsonville a las 8 de la mañana para el desayuno y registración. Um, daré la bienvenida a, los fam a las familias al evento en el Centro Melo y será seguida por nuestro orador principal a las 8.45. So we have three rotations of workshops around college and career readiness, 
immigration, gang and drug prevention, special education, um, emotional wellness, and parent leadership. And we will end the conference with a community resource fair. So, tendremos tres rotaciones de talleres sobre pre preparación de para la universidad y profesional, inmigración, prevención de bandidos y drogas, educación especial, bienestar emocional y liderazgo de padres. Termina, vamos a terminar la conferencia con una feria de recursos comentarios, um, comunitarios. Perdón. Um, so this year we have a special treat and seven lucky families will receive a brand new Chromebook donated by our partners, OmniPro. So good luck to all the families and we hope to see you there. So ese año tendremos un regalo especial y siete familias afortunados van a recibir un nuevo Chromebook donado por nuestros socios OmniPro. So buena suerte a todas las familias. Esperamos verlos allí. And finally, we will be participating in eight recruitment fairs. The first one is taking place today at CSUMB. And on the screen, you will see our recruitment flyer. Um, and we are also highlighting our excellent benefit package. So, además, estaremos participando en ocho ferias de reclutamiento. El primero tuvo lugar hoy en la Universidad de Monterey. En la pantalla van a ver el boletín. Um, estamos enfocando en los excelentes beneficios médicos que ofrecemos. So, thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you. Um, yeah, I hope to see you all there at the parent conference. I'm planning on going. And um, I have been um, a few times before, and it's really a fabulous um, event and opportunity for families and the community. So we are going to move to item 3.4, which is student recognition. And we are going to start with HA High student Isabella Brandon Ruiz. Please come forward with everybody who came to support you. you can come. Michael. Michael, we're going to actually we're have you come down, down here. here. Yeah. This way, please. Because then we will take your picture, your picture. If you and have your family picture. and other supporters here, everybody can come up. And then we'll get a picture afterwards. We got a big group. President DeRose, board members, Dr. Rodriguez, thank you for having us. It's an honor to be able to be here and with Izzy. Um, this is a special one for me because when Izzy and her classmates started, that was the first year I started at Hyde, and I've gotten to see her and them grow. Um, and she caught my eye early on as being the kind of student we look for who has all of the wonderful positive characteristics of a special individual. Um, at HA Hyde, we celebrate and recognize the character traits of Hyde Pride. Pride standing for uh, problem solving, respect, integrity, determination, and high expectations. Um, Izzy has consistently set high expectations for herself, and she's worked with determination and perseverance to meet all the goals that she's set. As a student, she has consistently performed um, at the advanced ac level academically, and as a student, um, but what truly makes her shine is the fact that she's such an amazing individual. Uh, she has a positive attitude, and she cares and respects all the students and teachers and, and community members of our school. Izzy's teachers say that she has um, always been a great helper, an invaluable friend to all, and, a, and a, um, a superstar within and beyond the walls of the classroom. Um, she truly wants to make the world a better place. And uh, one thing that came out in the conversation we had is what she sees herself doing in the future. So I want to share that with you. What do you see yourself doing in the future? I want to become an infectious disease doctor. Why do you want to become an infectious disease doctor specifically? 
So I can help people. So I can find cures to diseases that are not cure are not curable yet. And why is that personal for you? Um, because my friend she had she had a disease, and so I want to I want to have a cure for it. So you can see why her, we see her as having such a heart. She embodies the problem solving and respect and integrity that we look for in our students with our Hyde Pride. And that's why we're so honored to have her as our student of the year. Um, she's a model citizen. She, her hard work, kindness, and positive attitude make it easy to believe that she will surely meet these goals and all goals that she set, sets for herself. So congratulations, Izzy. Thank you. Isabel, um, it is easy to see why you are so successful with you because of all your uh, wonderful family here. Way to go. Congratulations from all of us to you. This is just a, um, this, is, this is the award for the student of the year. Way to go. Congratulations to all of you. So if you'd like to um, line up, maybe squish, squish in a little bit, we're gonna get a group photo for you and we can share that with you. Yeah, make sure Izzy's in the picture. <laughs> get cozy. Congratulations again. And um, our next student that we're going to recognize is from Valencia School, Hazel Gladish. Please come up. Okay, good evening, President DeRose, Dr. Rodriguez, board trustee members. My name is Karen Lane, and I'm honored to be the principal of Valencia Elementary School, and I'm thrilled to be here this evening with you to present our sixth grade student of the year, Ms. Hazel Gladish. Yay, Hazel. Hazel was selected by her peers, as well as our staff, as our sixth grade student of the year, and um, while Hazel has been at our school, she was fortunate enough to um, have one of our amazing and fabulous, talented teachers, Miss Erin Farrar, as her fourth and fifth grade teacher. So when Hazel was chosen, I asked if Erin would reflect on her time with Hazel and write a statement about her um, because of their deep and lasting connection. So I'm gonna pass it over to Erin, and um, congratulations to Hazel. Thanks, Mrs. Lane. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez and the board for having me as well. Uh, this is the first year I have to wear reading glasses, so excuse me. Excuse me for a moment. Uh, and this is also the longer version of what I wrote when I reflected about Hazel. I had to narrow it down to about 100 words for the newspaper, and that was quite tough, so give me a moment here, please. Um, Hazel Gladish beams like a ray of sunshine, reaching beyond the surface and infusing deeply into the layers of our heart, mind, and soul. She is genuine, positive, compassionate, and enthusiastic about wanting to learn everything she can. Hazel, hi sweetie. Hazel is a leader of respectful communication, deep critical thinking, and active engagement in the growth mindset. Hazel speaks eloquently about topics and themes and does not back away from social or academic challenges. She perceives challenges as interesting problems to solve. Hazel seems to have a unique knack for connecting with all types of people at various levels of understanding and achievement. She is an inspiration and model for implementing positive values and an inquisitive yet insightful outlook. In fourth grade, Hazel represented Valencia in the Santa Cruz County Spelling Bee and demonstrated advanced application of fourth and fifth grade standards in mathematics and reading. Fifth grade gave Hazel an opportunity to gain humble confidence and exploration of enrichment opportunities. 
While participating in the Santa Cruz County Trial Law Lawyers Association, thanks, Mrs. Lane, the elementary law program, thank you so much, a local attorney stated he had never heard such rich vocabulary from a fifth grader when Hazel was engaged in a government type discussion with him in the class. Every school year, Hazel reads over the goal of one million words and sets deeper goals for herself that includes books she is interested in, combined with classics and various genres. As sixth grade rolls on, and I did write this in November, so there's a little more that's happened since. As sixth grade rolls on, Hazel is a member of the leadership team and continues to participate in local organizations and opportunities like submitting baked goods in the Santa Cruz County Fair in earning PBUSD's second place with her green collaborative team for the Worldwide Peace Poster Competition. Hazel also volunteers to work with younger children at Valencia in any capacity needed. Hazel is a stellar role model and leader. It is with great pleasure that we at Valencia Elementary award Hazel the honor of Valencia Student of the Year. Congratulations, Hazel. Hi Hazel, my name is Kim Deserpa and I'm one of the board members and both of my kids went to Valencia and when they started there, there wasn't a whole lot going on so I got to work and did a lot of improvements to your school. One of the really cool things about Valencia and what I'd like to see at every school is that they have a science classroom and Valencia is very, very special because you have a, a fantastic science teacher and a science classroom. So congratulations on every superb thing that you've done so far and we expect big things from you and we know that you're going to go on to be a giant success and make everybody even prouder than they are today. Congratulations. I will add that Hazel um, was one of our top 10 science projects and is heading to the county fair in a couple of weeks to um, submit her project and share what she learned. So congratulations on that as well. All right. Okay, if everyone wants to scoot in for a picture. Thank you again for being here and congratulations. Okay, so um, on to item 3.5 and that is governing board comments, um, reports on standing committees. I'll start with Willie if you have anything. No? Yeah. Kim, do you have anything? <laughs> oh, so um, I went to my DLAC meeting, which is District English Language Advisory Committee for the TV, and um, they did a whole bunch of work about thinking about, um, you know, well, the, oh, I'm trying to think about the there, there was a lot of things that they did um, yesterday, and I'll hopefully give everybody a report later, but it, it was really great, all the work they did last night. And I also went to the Adult Education Advisory Committee, which was um, this morning, um, and I think that's what I was, the committees I've been able to be on. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, okay, item 4.0 is approval of the agenda, and we actually have an 
um, an item, I'm calling it a ghost item, it got dropped into the consent agenda call to order, which should not be there. Um, so if someone would like to make a motion with the removal of 11.27 from the consent agenda. Making a motion to approve our agenda <coughs> with the following changes. Removal of item 11.7. Two seven. Two seven, thank you. I'll second that motion. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the item passes six zero one. Five zero two. Five zero two, I'm sorry. I can't start doing math right now. <laughs> okay, um, item five, as approval of minutes 5.1 is the minutes of january 24th uh, does anyone um, i'll move approval of the minutes from january 24th 2018. thank you i will second that motion okay all those in favor aye aye, aye. any opposed item passes 502 and um, one of our favorite items is our high school board representative report six, which is item six do we have anybody we do and are you both from aptos yes okay and uh do we have anyone from any of our other high schools so it was just scheduled to be no? diamond tech and aptos today diamond tech did not come. okay 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 aptos welcome thank you for hosting us and we have it, a presentation and i had i shared it with david okay are we set up for that david are we you are set up for that Towards the booth. Make sure the microphone is on and you state your names, please. And welcome. Okay. Hi, my name is Caitlin. And my name is Becca. We're both seniors at Aptos. And this presentation is going to focus on the four A's beginning with academics. Hmm. There we go. So right now, our AP classes are preparing our students for all of our AP tests in this upcoming May, and our seniors are starting to get back their letters from colleges and really focusing on scholarships right now. And we're holding a bunch of meetings around campus to help inform students about how to apply to scholarships and which scholarships to apply to. Our College and Career Center is being extremely helpful with this. Both personally, myself, I've dealt with them, and a lot of my friends have they're very personal and they help you understand exactly what you need to do to apply for these scholarships. Also, our WASC program will be visiting us this March to accredit our school. And right now in athletics. Okay. All of our spring sports have begun and that includes lacrosse, track and field, baseball, swimming, and boys tennis. And our boys varsity basketball team has fought hard, and so we have our first CCS playoff game tomorrow here. And dance team in their last competition won six, um, won six medals, and they have another one coming up this Saturday, and hopefully we're going to do pretty good at that one. And cheer actually leaving tomorrow is headed to nationals in Disneyland to perform. Cheer. <laughs> the drama department is putting on Rod Richard Rogers' version of Cinderella, and it's opening, opening April 12th, and they've been working super hard. It's going to be an amazing show. They've been working since before winter break, so I suggest everyone comes and watches it. And photography has printed their first round of pictures, so that's exciting. Everyone's learning how to do that. And we started a bullet journaling club, and I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but it's basically like you make a journal of everything, and you get to decorate it, and they're really cool, a lot of calligraphy in them. And there's a choir performance here in the PAC on March 17th. As for activities right now, ASB is planning our Spring Spirit Week, which is five, five days of dress-up days. And at the end of the week, we're holding a rally, including student games and even a band performance by one of our own teachers. And we're holding a dance that same Friday. And all students are welcome, and it should be a really great turnout. Um, also on that Friday, we're having a club carnival to improve our club to improve our club um, involvement on campus, 
to let students become a part of the community. Um, we're also having our annual community service <coughs> fair happening in, I think, April. And right now, we're working with administration on sending letters of support to Parkland and make our campus safer and more knowledgeable about what to do in the case of an emergency. And that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on, we're at item 7.1, public comment, uh, visitor non-agenda items. And it looks like we might have a couple or three speakers, and we have three minutes each for speakers, and Maria will call you up. Okay, the first speaker is Laura, followed by Bill Beecher. different setup. Anyway, good evening, um, board members, cabinet, Dr. Rodriguez, Alicia and Eva. Um, okay, I want to talk about just about three things. We've talked about this before. Um, we have a hard time attracting teachers and keeping them, and I'm just going to talk about special ed. I love my special ed colleagues. We, I love my, my administrators, love the kids. Um, but it's very hard to get people to come and do jobs that are sometimes very difficult. And one, some news we got recently is that Duncan Holbert, you know, our preschool, is, uh, they like to say they're bursting at the seams. They have so many preschoolers that'll be coming into the elementary level. So we've been told that we'll have 15 new kindergartners coming next year, which will mean for the first time since anyone remembers, instead of having a kinder second class and a third fifth class at Hyde, we would also have a, an entire kinder class. Because, and we'd still be too large, right? We, we can't have 15 in the classroom. But that's quite shocking to have that many coming in, which means we're just gonna be, well, growing by one class, if not two classes. And we already have a hard time to get uh, SPED teachers. For instance, in Lakeview, as you all know, at the beginning of the year, the autism class had a series of substitutes. And we finally did get a very good teacher, apparently. I talked to one of the parents, and they're very happy with him, but we had a couple, three months of substitutes. There's the other mild moderate at um, Lakeview that apparently has had substitutes for a long time. And now at Starlight, one of our mild, mo great mild moderate class, she, they've had a substitute also since the beginning of the year. So it does come down to a question of money. <clears throat> and what I would like to suggest is that you all think really seriously, that the board thinks seriously about not having 6% reserve, right? Because we only need a 3% by law. And earlier in the year, you all voted to put an extra 3% in the reserve. And it's a big reserve. I mean, I, we can argue numbers, what? We think it's 57 million, even if it's 40 million. Um, take half of that out. Just all, all we need is the 3%. It's perfectly legal to have 3% in the reserve. And we could use that money to put a raise, even a small raise, <laughs> on the salary schedule. Because that is how we'll, we will attract people, not with bonuses. As our signs say, we don't want to strike. And if we don't get a raise on the salary schedule, we're saying it, we will do it. We don't want to do it, but we will strike. And this is the first time in my experience we've talked about strikes. Strikes are serious business. No one does it lightly. Um, I know my labor history. I've been in the labor movement. I was a teamster when I was 19. No one, no union, and no worker wants to strike. The community will support us. You've seen all the signs out there that say support teachers, and when we walk precincts, families always say we're right behind you, et cetera, we believe you, we believe the money's there, we believe the money's there for, for the teachers and for the kids. So <clears throat> it would not be pleasant in terms of how the district is perceived, how the administration is perceived, if we do go on strike, 
And at any rate, for attracting other people, strikes are not pleasant. It's not, it's not fun. It's not something people want to do. It, there's going to be divisiveness. We don't want to go through that. So we'll do as, the best we can to not go on strike, but we need you to help us. And really to make a decision to fight for us to get a, a uh, raise on the salary schedule so that we don't have to take that very big and very serious step. Okay? And I know you all can do it. I know that all the board members, you are allies, I consider you all allies. I know it's hard to be the first person or the first two or three people who say, okay, let's take that 3% out of the reserve. Let's make sure we don't have to go and leave, you know, go on strike. It's hard to be that person, but I know you're all allies of the students and of the teachers and of the community and you want to do the right thing and that's why you're here. So I hope that can happen. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, last night at the Citizens Oversight uh, Committee meeting, uh, a teacher brought up a question uh, at their school and I thought I would share that with you because I think it has some relevance looking forward. And the issue was they've got teachers who they're not, there's not enough classrooms at uh, their school, so they have to, uh, for VAPA and for science classes, they're putting their materials on a cart and they run it around the school looking for classrooms. Now, I know this is true at other schools because I've gotten similar feedback, and so, I think there's an unintended consequence that started when we did class size reduction that put a squeeze on classroom. Then we added VAPA and we've been pushing STEM and you go, we need some classrooms. Uh, we're having to bus students out of Radcliffe over to other schools because there's not enough classrooms. Now Measure L, which I'm involved with, doesn't cover new classrooms, but I think we as a district have to think about that. Now, if the rumors are right that Governor Brown has some money in his pocket, you've got several choices that you have, one of which would be you use that money to put in some new classrooms. They're, well, they're very much needed. On the other hand, <coughs> you could increase the heating budget so that you, know, you could heat this room up. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, it's a well-known fact in administrative circles that if you keep the room cold, the meetings run much faster. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I thought we had three, we had two. Um, let's see where we are. Okay, we're at item 8.0, employee organization comments. Um, we will go with 8.1 PVFT, and these are five minutes each. And it looks like Francisco Rodriguez is here. Hi, thank you, Francisco Rodriguez. Um, it's, it's been a while. That I don't think I've had a chance to say Happy New Year yet. But um, just uh, your, the previous speaker mentioned uh, uh, Governor Brown uh, uh, or Governor Brown's budget. Um, let me reassure you, it's not a rumor. It's true. I sent you an email in November saying that the uh, expectation was that 2018 was going to be a very good budget for California. And in January, um, I again sent you another email uh, noting that uh, there is a really good budget in California. and. Uh, you have an opportunity to solve the problem that we have, we both have, you and I and our members. It's, it is possible to solve it. Now, I do want to also um, add a few other uh, comments regarding uh, information that has been going out um, from various sources. Uh, the first one is on salary comparisons. Um, there, as you know, there is this forms that districts voluntarily uh, fill called the J90 forms. Um, and they are useful in comparing districts. 
but the compares, but those districts that you compare, those have to be comparable districts. It can't be, for example, di all districts in Santa Cruz County, because our district encompasses, I think, over 50% of the student enrollment, whereas Happy Valley may have, like, I think it's seven teachers, maybe, FTEs. So it's not a comparable comparison. What we need to do is compare ourselves with districts that have similar ADA and similar demographics. Because remember, uh, we now have funding based on your number of unduplicated English language learners and low social economic students. Okay? The other uh, thing that's been going around is the so-called silent increases uh, due to the uh, increased cost of STIRS uh, that I've been mentioning. Unfortunately, you don't mention that your employees are getting a silent pay cut as well because their contributions have also increased. So the so-called 11% raise in 11 years, it's not really 11% because as I said, we are paying more out of pocket for those STIRS contributions. Uh, the other is benefit costs. So you, you've had presentations about how our costs for benefits are 200 and something, I don't know, I don't even remember the number, um, but higher than, than other districts. But um, even when you take the cost of benefits and you do the uh, comparable districts, we are still below the average. And in addition, I want to point out to you that every time that you have followed the contract, it has resulted in a lowering of the cost of benefits. As an example, when we moved from being self-insured to CISC, the district followed the contract and it resulted in a, a savings. When you wanted to add additional lower cost plans, you followed the contract and it resulted in savings for both the district and the employees. Okay, compare that with last spring when you ignored the contract and you tried to um, implement a cap on your contributions to our benefits and it resulted in the mess that we are in now. In, 20, in I believe 2009, <coughs> The same thing happened. We also went to mediation. Fortunately, we were able to resolve our differences there. But it was for the same cause. You try to implement a cap by ignoring the contract. So what we would like to see is a movement on your side to allow for increases in on the salary schedule for all of our members uh, going back to 2016-17 and uh, we hope that uh, our the members that have come in uh, previous meetings have made that clear and that um, soon when we meet with our mediator we can come to an agreement thank you Do we have anyone here from CSEA? No. Um, Pavam? CWA? Okay. So we're going to move to item nine, and that is action items. And our first item is 9.1, and this is a resolution acknowledging February as Black History Month. And uh, we have a resolution here, and there's um, a couple, a little bit of it that I would like to read um, in recognition of this month. Yes. Oh, here you go. Okay. Is, it, yeah. is it okay that I stay? Yes, yes. Here. Please. So, good evening, President DeServa, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. 
Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity um, for the Acknowledgement of Black History Month, uh, Resolution 171820. The resolution was put together not only by um, me, but also the Ethnic Studies Committee. The big point um, being that we would really like this, take this opportunity to recognize this month as well as continued study throughout the year um, with the ethnic studies. We're really trying to push that uh, all ethnic studies, regardless of race, religion, should be done throughout the year, not just in the specific time period where it is recognized in our country. So with that, um, whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District recognizes that Black History Month is the opportunity to promote and foster cultural revel relevance in our schools and enrich the educational experiences of our students to deepen their understanding of the different perspectives of American history. Also, Pajaro Valley Unified School District encourages PBUSD educators to celebrate, honor, and study the contributions of African Americans throughout the year and to include the lived experiences every month. Therefore, be it resolved that Pajaro Valley Board of Trustees acknowledges February 2018 as Black History Month and recognizes the significance of Black History Month as an important time to acknowledge and celebrate the contributions of African Americans in the nation's history and that the Board of Trustees encourages the continued celebration of the month to provide an opportunity for all members of the district to learn more about the past and to better understand the experiences that have shaped the nation and the world. And with that, we are asking um, for your pass, pass to, passing of the resolution. Thank you, Lisa. Um, do I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the resolution. Okay, Kim and Willie seconded. All those in favor? Oh, I was just going to say something. I, oh, okay. I was just going to say, um, actually, I was hoping that it would say a little bit more about African Americans because, you know, when we do resolutions on, you know, people, we talk about all the great stuff that they've done and how much we appreciate for the, all the stuff that they've done. So I was, I, I was looking at it and I thought, whoa, there should be more about actually African Americans and, the, and, and what they have done for us in our history and you know, whatever, I thought. I, so that's what I thought. I thought there should be more said about them. Thanks. So we talked about in the beginning that um, some, how it came to be and some of the things, but the thing is, is that it's not such a small piece. It is a huge piece of history. And if we just put in the small things that people know, it we want everybody to go in and actually teach it within the classrooms and do the research. And so what it is, it's, it's every month and we don't want it just to be one month. We want it to be a lived curriculum throughout the year. Okay, thank you. Um, so with that, I will ask for a vote. All of those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 502. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. And um, item 9.2, school accountability report cards. And this uh, is a presentation by Susan. It says prepared. Is it presented by you as well? Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, good evening, President DeRose, Dr. Rodriguez, and board members. Um, every year, we are required um, to report and post for each of our school sites a school accountability report card, or SARC. Um, these SARCs are, while they are published in the current year, they are based on information from the prior year. So the SARCs that we um, put together and published a couple of months ago are based on data from 1617 and in some cases 1516. Um, so as we go through the various components, whoops, of, oh dear, <laughs> um, of the SARC, um, what we want to point out is that while the SARC itself is old data, most of the SARC is actually very much aligned with our LCAP, which is based on current information and establishes current goals. So there are five different components to each SARC. Um, a first section that just is basic descriptions, uh, conditions of learning, pupil outcomes, engagement, and other SARC information is a final section that 
um, has a mix of items. But what you will see as we go through this is that those, um, the center three are actually complete, in fact, the last one as well, completely aligned to our LCAP. So the first section about the school is just basically that, basic information about the school. Um, some demographic, school mission, and just a narrative description of the school. A lot of the same information that is in the opening section of each school's school plan. The second section, which is called conditions of learning, includes teacher credentials, textbooks and instructional materials, and school facilities. This is exactly what we um, report out in our Williams visits in the fall, and this is what we have in our LCAP under high quality learning environments, which is described in goal four. The next sections of the SART called pupil, pupil outcomes includes information on previous year CASP scores, on the physical fitness test, and at the high school level career technical education programs. This is addressed in what we call the 21st century learning portion of our LCAP which is goals one and two. The next section of the um, SARCs, which is referred to as the engagement section, includes information on parental involvement, dropout and graduation rates, suspensions and expulsions, and school safety plan information. And that is directly aligned to what we call our connectedness goals that address culture and climate. Those are both goals six and seven in our LCAP. So again, what I want to point out to you is that almost everything that is in the SARCs is also in our LCAP, in our LCAPs and in our school plans. And then the very last section, which is called other information, um, includes some information about program, a federal program interventions, class size, um, support staff, funding, um, advanced placement at the high school level, and professional development. The majority of this is also included in our LCAP um, under goals one and six. So the SARCs need to be posted every year in February. We have posted them on all of our school websites. They are posted in both English and Spanish. Um, I included examples from one elementary and one high school SARC for your information in the board packet. And at this point, um, I can address questions. Um, but what we need for you to do is approve the posting of the SARCs onto the various websites. Thank you, Susan. Um, we do have a speaker to this item, so uh, we'll go ahead and take this speaker and then open up to board comments and questions. Do we have Bill Beecher? Susan has the clicker. And we're waiting for the presentation to come up. Last month at the previous meeting, I spoke about our academic performance and how disappointed I was with it. Uh, I'm also disappointed in this presentation because there's real no analyses on, if you were to look at the SARCs, each one of them, what did we learn from it? How are we doing? There's no comment on that. So let's take a look at the two that they included. I've got Ansaldo first. Um, gee, the English language and the math year to year, there's basically no change, which was my comment uh, at the previous meeting. But in science, they did make improvement, and I think that's great. But it goes along with my comment that kids are doing better in science. Let's, let's peel it down because uh, I think this is germane. English learners, which is over a third of our students, and students with disabilities, which is a seventh of our students, their scores suck. And if you look at the migrant education, it's even worse. I'm embarrassed. If we look at math, the same story. It's, it's even worse than the English language arts. 
Let's look at Aptos. Here you see our best high school, but no improvement, nothing's changing. If I look at science, again, they score very high. But if I peel the onion, English learners, and this is at our best high school, less than 19%, a sixth or so, actually meet the standard. That's not very good. Students with disabilities actually do much better at Aptos than at the other schools. If I look at math, uh, same, same issues, whether it's Ansaldo or Aptos, that English learners and students with disabilities do not do well. So, what happened to Common Core? Common Core was rolled out several years ago as a way for us to improve our performance. Our performance hasn't improved. So is the issue, is it what we teach rather than how we teach? And students do better at science and math, why? I suggest that the board and the administration should go around to the school and talk to the kids and talk to the teachers, which I have, and you get some pretty clear answers on why kids like science. Not because I say it, they do. Now my issue here tonight is special needs in migrant students. It's not a problem just for our school district, it's true across the state. These kids are doomed. When they come out of our school system, they aren't ready for anything. They're not ready for college, they're not ready for jobs. We haven't done them a job. We've buried them. And we don't pay attention. We spend more time talking about VAPA than we do about special needs. You had a teacher up earlier who talked about special needs. It's a tough job. We've got to do a better job. Those same special need kids, a third of them are above the state standard in science. If they can do that, why can't they do it in math and in English? Think about that. So when the board is going to hold, when is the board going to hold the district accountable for poor performance? When you see no improvement, why aren't you asking the questions that I'm asking? My wife beats me up over dinner because she says, why aren't you guys actively involved asking these kind of questions? I have no answers for her. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Beecher. Okay, um, now I'll open it up to questions from the board or comments. Kim. So this is um, perhaps a question for Dr. Rodriguez. Um, we, you know, we've been on the board long enough. We know what the SARC report is. Do we? Why do we get a presentation that just tells us the components of the SARC instead of actually discussing the results? Well, the main reason why we do that is because the SARC is based on old data. And so having a conversation, a really thorough conversation on trends and patterns about old data is frankly useless. The reason why we do the SARC and the reason why we have the template for the SARC that we do is because it's district, it's state mandated. Um, what you're gonna see a little bit later tonight is the analysis that we're doing with our map data, which has a high correlation with our SBAC data or our CAS data. So for me, I find no, no reason for us to actually spend significant time on SARC um, when for me it's just um, a mandated report that's out there so that parents have a good comprehensive view of what's happening at multiple levels for the site. But as was mentioned, in some cases that data is almost two years old. So looking at attendance data that's two years old really won't provide as much information. But looking at data, which we're gonna do tonight, which is about three months old, two months old, will tell us a lot about what's happening. Is it mandated that it, this particular topic come before the board? Yes, year? you must approve it to go on the website. Okay. Um, I, you know, I know you were not here two years ago. 
Um, and I understand that talking about the, the data potentially from a year ago or two years ago might, might not be valuable for you, but those of us who have been sitting here in these seats sort of demanding action and hoping for better outcomes. It, it, it is interesting and important for us to know what happens. So from year to year, we just kind of brush it under the carpet, like, oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, but it kind of does matter. So I don't know. Um, so most school districts have this item under consent. It's just a pure consent item. Most, most school districts don't actually do a presentation on this. I agree that looking at trajectory data is important. Um, what I will say is, since that data is not representative of what we've done in the last 18 months, yeah. um, that for me, I'm not going to spend much cognitive energy on it. Yeah, I guess I would like to see the trajectory just year to year to year. I think that would be helpful um, to every, just every year to see that. So we'll definitely do that with the CAS data, and we're going to be showing you some of that today on MAP. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, so just addressing um, Bill's point, we are um, hoping to have a study session around the results so that we as a board can really look at what's going on and really focus on the areas of need moving forward. Okay, so you know, my question is a broader question. It's about why are we mandated to put old data on our websites if it really serves us um, no purpose? For, uh, you know, in, in terms of where we've gone, um, what we've seen, the positive changes that we've seen in the last 18 months, doesn't seem like it serves this district or any district well when you're making positive change and then you're mandated to post old data that you're trying and are in, improving on. Um, so I don't think that's good for the community um, or the district or the students. It can make the students feel horrible about you know, their day-to-day -day classroom experience. So, so the SARC was done in an effort for transparency with the community and making sure that the parents knew all these different elements, right? Knew all about the credentialing of their teachers, the pay of the teachers, all the uh, adoptions that are done. Um, unfortunately, sometimes in, when people, when legislators do um, certain rules, um, they don't necessarily talk to the people on the ground that are doing the work. And so they mandate legislation that is such. Um, we've had recommendations of we should per make the data look differently. Um, we're not allowed to do that. It's a, it's a structured template. Um, and so we can't just change the SARC template. Um, it's actually a mandated um, template. Um, and so as I had mentioned before, most school districts have it under consent and it's not really something that they're really truly looking at, um, but rather at their own dashboards. Um, which we, we currently do not have a data dashboard, a district data dashboard, other than Illuminate. Um, and so that's something else that we need to do within the next couple of years as well. Okay. Well, I think that we should use our voices as a district and talk to our legislative representatives about amending that legislation so it's more accurate and um, more telling of what is actually going on. I'm sure other districts aren't pleased with this either. So, um, you know, the us as board members, this is, you know, part of where um, we have our strength is we do have a voice for our district. So um, we have, have the ability to get in contact with those representatives and ask for change if that's what we want. So I would in, encourage anybody to do that and even the community as well. So thank you. Willie? Would it, would it be uh, possible to have, um, have the second board meeting of each month centered upon a, a study session just on academic stuff? Would, this, this setting is very hard to discuss um, problems in, in math and uh, science and so forth, so that we have one meeting, you know, the first meeting to handle the business end of the district and the second meeting every month to really focus in on probably the most important thing is, 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 is the academic achievement. 
Would that be would that be possible? Um, we can definitely do um, additional presentations, and we try to do that every time that we have a data set. Um, for us not to be able to do any consent items other than once a month is challenging. I'll have to say that we, when we only have one board meeting in July, um, sometimes it's difficult on staff because we have things that need more urgent attention than just a month from then. Um, we can, of course, um, during agenda setting, we can talk about how we can rearrange our time to try to do the best that we can do um, and continue to focus. I think um, I've demonstrated that my key focus is always the academics of our students, so we just need to continue to do those presentations for you all. Okay. So, Willie, I think that's a great idea, and it's something that we talk about, but I think getting a regular study session on the tickler may be something that you want to do where we do it quarterly or twice a year or something like that, so we sure. know we're going to do it on a regular basis, and um, that way we're staying on top of things and we can look at trends and um, react when we need to react, okay? Are there any other comments? Okay, this is an action item, so I need um, a motion to approve the posting of the SARC reports on the school websites. So I'll make a motion to approve the SARC websites, or SARC, so I'm sorry, SARC school accountability report card being posted on all of our websites. Okay, Maria seconded, and all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 502, thank you. And our next item is 9.3. This is a UCSC EAOP early access and opportunity program. That's myself. I believe. Yeah, this um, Service agreement, mm -hmm. and um, this report is by Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah. Okay, so good evening. So as you know, this past year, um, we no longer had, and it's really hard to see you guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, as you know, we no longer had the Gear Up grant. So this year, we no longer had the Gear Up grant, but we did have still the EAOP grant. Next year, we will have neither. Um, and so last year, or last year, the, the Board, I asked the board to make a commitment to continue the college and career centers. As you heard from our students today, they didn't have a college and career center here at Aptos High until this year. This is the first year. And so this is a three-year agreement. The reason why we're doing a three-year agreement is to lock in the price, so to speak. Um, because what has happened is as as um, UCSC is receiving more um, increases as they're receiving more raises, then the, those costs get transplanted to us. Um, we are in the, pro the other reason why we're doing the three years is because we still are in the process of trying to regain the gear up money for the middle school level. If we can be successful in doing that, which we believe that we will, we've already resubmitted, is that then that would be three years and we'd be back to the high school at that point. As you may remember, um, the Gear Up grant goes by a cohort. So it would be sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders, and then it would go back to the high school level. So this would allow us to sustain the college and career centers for the three years um, until the Gear Up grant hopefully is back. And so I really encourage you, um, as the heart of what we're doing, whether it's LCAP or our target for student success, is college and career readiness. And so I believe that our actions need to be directed towards supports for the students to get there. Do we have any speakers? We do not. We don't. OK, so um, I'll open it up if there's questions or comments from the board. doing this um, since we don't have the gear up grant and because there's so many ways that they benefit students including you know helping them with scholarships you know finding scholarships and um, you know the seeing them all the way through their time um, whether it be in high school or whatever middle school hopefully too um, and just you know giving them the support they need to 
do better, I guess, um, and pursue a college career too. Thank you. Can you explain what happened with the loss of the, both those grants, EAOP and Gear Up? Sure. Um, well, what had happened is they transitioned out of the high school. So regardless, we weren't going to have it at the high school level. It was going to go back to sixth grade. So it, because it goes up the cohort, then it went to the 12th grade, got to the 12th grade, and it was going to go back. So no matter what, we weren't going to have it at the high school level. Um, the problem was is that um, we did not, um, we were, we're not the one that actually submits, so UCSC does it for us, but um, UCSC submitted the, um, the grant paperwork. They submitted almost identical um, proposals for Monterey and for us. Monterey got funded. We did not get funded um, because it was based on a subjective score. We can't challenge it. Um, we did get information back of why we got the low score, and it was actually in our proposal. What they said was missing was in our proposal, but because it was the subjective part, we couldn't, um, we couldn't um, challenge. challenge it. And so um, we are resubmitting. More monies came out, and we're resubmitting it. What would have happened before if we would have got it from the start is we would have only had to have done two years of a renewal and not three. Um, basically, we lost an extra year. Um, but we feel like um, we're going to resubmit. We made um, some minor tweaks, and we hope to be funded. Um, but it was due to that. The EOP um, was on a different grant, grant cycle. We got an extra year of funding um, because we asked for it, um, an extra transition year. So that's why we had a little bit of extra funding from EOP this year. Yeah. Um. So we're resubmitting on the middle school, is that right? Mm -hmm. And then, already been resubmitted. so if that gets resubmitted, will it lower the dollar cost no. of this particular contract? No. So this is a one point four million dollar contract. So it's about a half a million dollars every year for this program. That is correct. Um, and do you know what the percentage that UCSC takes out for um, administrative overhead or? So if you look at it, it's actually very low. They have, um, they have so many, much of their overhead is not, being, um, is not being tasked to us because they want us to continue with the program. Um, the grand majority of it, it, there is some administrative cost because we're paying for a portion of, um, of Sophia's um, pay. Um, but she also is doing all three sites, overview of all three sites. Um, and it's only a portion of her pay. Um, most of it is actual tutors and people that are at the sites every single day. Is there any alternative monies that could be found in other state or federal areas to supplement? Yeah, so we're receiving a lot of grants. Um, we just received another grant today for our project Lead the Way. Um, so we just received another $30,000 grant. Um, what we're trying to do is actually take those grants and use it for and push it into different areas so that we have money for other things. Um, right now, there are no monies out there for college and career centers. There's a lot out there for BAPA, for foster youth, and for um, CTE pathways. And so we're going after those monies. That's great. And this is a, a worthy program, and I'm in support of, it's been impactful. Uh, of this Thank contract. You. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Melody's name is on this contract, um, okay. so we need that to correct that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for catching that, Kim. Any other comments, Maria or Willie? Nope. No? Okay. Well, um, I, too, am in full support of this, and um, I, my ears did perk up when our Aptos High students talked about their college and career center and how much it helped them. I was really happy to hear that. I haven't seen it yet, but I'll definitely come back and take a look. Um, so again, this is an action item. So I'm looking for a motion to approve the service agreement with UCSC. I so motion. Willie made a motion. Do you oh, want a second? I'll second. Okay. So motion by Willie, second by Karen. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 502. Thank you. And item 9.4 is election of a representative to the California School Boards Association Delegate Assembly. 
And this also is a presentation by Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, thank you. So we have, um, we have the opportunity to select some regional representatives as our CSBA delegates. And so this year previously, there was a request for delegate nominations. Um, these delegates will serve a two-year terms, and it will begin April 1st and end um, March 31st, 2020. Um, there are some requirements of the people that are um, attending. They must attend the Legislative Action Conference in Sacramento, and they must um, also go to the annual conference um, in December. So CSBA doesn't pay for travel expenses um, associated with it. If you look at the attachment, you will see that we are being asked to vote on um, two candidates. There are currently three candidates that are um, up for nomination. So it's um, Donna Jones from Mountain, um, Mountain Elementary School District, um, Phil Rodriguez from um, SoCal Union, and Deborah Tracy from um, Pr uh, Prulix. I don't know how to say I would say it's Prulix, um, from Santa Cruz City Schools. And so we would like um, you, if you would like to nominate any of them, um, we need to vote on um, t only two candidates, or up to two candidates. Um, you should do a nomination and then a vote one at a time. Okay. So are there any nominations from the board on the delegate assembly members for CSBA? My first nomination would be for Deborah Tracy okay. and from is Santa Cruz City. Is there a second? I'll second. So vote on each one separately. So all those in favor? Do you, want uh, me to, do, do you want me to say anything about her first? or If you would like to. So I don't know if you guys know her, but she um, sits with me on the school board association. She's, um, she's sharp, very sharp, and um, she has served in this capacity, I think, once already, and she's been really good at um, bringing uh, important issues to the forefront of the school board association things that we should work on which i've then either forward to you all or passed on to you verbally so i think she'd be a, a good candidate thanks okay thank you uh so all of those in favor aye. aye aye any opposed motion passes by zero two and are there any other nominations i'll nominate well his last name is rodriguez from the socal uh, district. Okay, and is there a second? I oh, will second that nomination. Okay, and a second by Maria. And are, is there any discussion? I don't, I don't feel qualified to vote. I don't know these guys. Mm -hmm. They're great. Both, the, both Donna and Phil are great people and um, long serving board members, both of them. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I would be happy with anyone that wants to volunteer. So is there anything else that you can share about Mr. Rodriguez just for more information for board members who may not know? I think he's served a long time and he's really a very nice person. I think he would do a fine job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's also from, you know, the last one's from such a tiny district, so I'm glad he's from a little bit bigger district too. <laughs> okay. So I'll go ahead and call for a vote then. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. I will abstain. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, sure that he, he has a, a very fine reputation and I would be pleased with anyone. At least, you know, him too. Okay. So, uh, motion passes four yes, one abstention, and two absent. Um, item 9.5 is ratification of an MOU with San Diego County Office of Education for Career and Technical Education Clear Credentialing Assistance. That was a mouthful. And okay, thanks, so Pam Shanks is here to give us that. I'm going to present this information. I, I do apologize. I um, don't know a whole lot about this information. I'm presenting on half of, behalf of Chona. 
this evening. Um, our school district does work closely with our County Office of Education in Santa Cruz um, on recruitment efforts to fill various different teaching positions. And this um, MOU is actually with San Diego County Superintendent of Schools. Um, that's gonna be able to provide a partnership and support for our teachers that we are uh, recruiting for in specialized areas such as career technical fields. Um, so this partnership will involve uh, providing support for applicants and possibly our current teachers who are working towards their credential in designated subjects of adult and career technical education as they work uh, in their credential program. So the memorandum of understanding will be effective from 2017 through 2022. So I'm just asking for the board to approve this tonight. Okay, and do we have any speakers to this item? None. Okay, and questions, comments from the board? Yes. Willie? What, what, um, help, what help, or help can we expect from this uh, partnership? So you will see on the item there's an attachment um, that talks about the scope of services um, that the county w agrees to as um, acting as the LEA. So um, it goes through various different supports um, working as a uh, liaison with the Commission on Teacher Credentialing and so forth, so it outlines it on the back there. And then um, the letter B under the scope of services is what we as a district will provide to these teachers. Uh, by by uh, supporting this um, partnership, are we going to be um, at the, at, on the list for future graduates to be able to come here? For future what, I'm sorry? Well, we're, we're uh, trying to expand our CTE program. Is, is uh, this program going to help us get people here, teachers here? Um, I think that this um, MOU would provide um, ha another agency to help provide support for those teachers. I don't know if it's really a recruiting um, effort, but it's more if we are recruiting folks with these types of credentials that they would help provide that support so they could finish their credential and continue their education in that credential area. I would, I would, I would hope that if we support this program, we will be able to get some PR value in being able to recruit graduates from, from these universities that are qualified to be uh, CTE leaders here. And I'm not really quite sure um, if there's any recruitment efforts being done in San Diego for teachers. I'm not um, familiar with which places we're going exactly, but um, that's definitely something I can relay to Chona as um, um, mm -hmm. efforts to recruit in these fields. So it, it essentially this part of what this partnership is doing, so I'm clear, is not for recruitment purposes, but essentially they're providing training on this area of need to the teachers that we're hiring? Either teachers that we're hiring or teachers who are working towards their credential in these career technical fields. And so they're gonna be helping provide support um, with kind of, as I mentioned, as a liaison with the Commission on Teacher Credentialing so that they can complete their credential um, in that area. But those are for current teachers that we have. Right, so they're for teachers who are currently, do not fit within the CT requirements, but we want them to, so that we can actually include it in our um, CT pathways Got it. and use Perkins funds. We can't use Perkins funds on non-CT credential teachers. Thank you. And any other questions? Okay. Is there a dollar amount associated with this MOU? I don't believe so. Okay, so so we'll pay as we go, or this, I don't understand. This is, the backup for this was not um, robust. Like, I'm confused about this whole um, agenda item. So okay, I have one, I have another question, which is so our does our COE know that we're doing this, and do they give us permission? Yes, we okay. um, we were requested by them actually to oh. bring this MOU forward from okay. the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. Okay, so yes. San Diego must have a special uh, specialization Program. in CTE credentialing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. 
Thank you. Yeah, I don't see anything about funding. I, I can find out about that. I don't think that there is, but I will double check for you and we can get back to you on that. So in case someone heard, heard me, I actually had something different open. And you may have heard me say $81,000. That did not apply <laughs> to this, um, um, this item. But um, usually, so before we move, move to board docs, on our agendas, it would have um, a line where it said, is there a budget implication? Yes or no, it's and how there. much? It's still it is there. still there. It's up top. It says budget source, which says NA. So I believe uh -huh. that it is. Um, my understanding is that there is no cost. Uh, okay, that would make sense. You so need a COE. Okay. Because somebody in, has to be paying, though. Is it our COE? Do you think? Well, not always. Okay. Be because of agreements that the COEs have between themselves and just monies that they receive, sometimes in turn they're doing it. Um, in an effort to provide technical assistance of the money that they receive from the state. Yeah. So most of the time the money doesn't have to come from us, but it actually comes from the state. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that is an action item. So I'm looking for a motion to approve the MOU. I'll so move. I will second. Okay, um, that's Kim and Maria. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None opposed, so motion passes 502. Thank you. And item 10.0, report and discussion items. The first item is the instructional cycle, summits and um, map growth data. And uh, this is also by um, Assistant Superintendent Aguirre. It will actually be by all three of us. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, once again, good evening, um, President DeRose, Dr. Rodriguez, and board members. Um, do we have, oops, I don't think I have the clicker any longer. And um, we have a PowerPoint for this. But to um, begin with some background, last year we put in place um, for the first time a new assessment system in place of our old benchmarks um, called NWEA Majors of Progress, um, Academic Progress, or MAP. And this was a new assessment that we put in place to be able to more closely monitor um, our students' academic progress in language arts and mathematics um, so that we were not waiting until the end of the year and looking in the fall at CASP scores from the prior spring. So beginning last fall, when we put MAP in place, we also put in place an instructional cycle that would allow us to work closely with school sites to monitor the MAP data and to ensure that teachers are, were responding to that data and that plans were in place um, to utilize the data and supports um, in a, a positive, um, progressive manner. So the, we have a process um, that starts with our school sites um, taking uh, the MAP assessment in the fall in both language arts and mathematics to get a baseline. Um, that analysis takes place, and our schools also are looking at their CASP scores at that time. But they come forward um, to a first summit where principals present uh, to cabinet their instructional plans to address areas of growth based on those baseline map scores in language arts and math. Um, in Oct and they do that in September. In October, cabinet um, visits each school site doing collaborative visits where we go in classrooms with staff and gather data on the evidence of the goals that they are working towards. And then we report, that information is reported out to the entire staff. Mid-year um, for K-8 in December and then for high schools in um, actually January and February, students take a mid-year map assessment in both language arts and mathematics again 
And at this point, we are closely monitoring growth from fall to winter. So certain schools um, are invited to a second summit that takes place in January, February, um, as those MAP scores come in. And those schools are selected based on lack of growth from fall to winter with their MAP scores. At that mid-year summit, principals are expected to present a very specific plan of action to address those areas where there was lack of growth from fall to spring. Um, although it is not up here, there is also a second collaborative visit that takes place during the spring to be monitoring those actions that principals established mid-year to address areas of growth. At the end of the year, um, that entire instructional plan is reviewed um, by the assistant soup of elementary and secondary in their end of year reflective consultations with principals. Um, at the second summit, which, and those second summits have been taking place and are continuing to take place, um, those involve a discussion about the area of growth, um, plans to address those areas of growth, and how they will be measured. And those are very powerful conversations. Um, there is a lot uh, discussed. Principals are sharing ideas, concerns, um, and innovative uh, strategies that they are trying. And we had an example last year um, at Bradley Elementary when, as a result of this process, they put in place a literacy summit. And um, Lisa will describe that a little bit more in detail and uh, take you through the next part of our presentation. So last year what Bradley put in place is um, he had a conversation with some of his teachers to look at the lack of growth and the staff decided that they'd have um, literacy summits twice a year. And the literacy summits take a look at the data that teachers give or different um, assessments and they discuss strategies that they can do in the classroom to see whether it's working or not. They've also set a school-wide goal where 90%, their school-wide goal, this is based on the um, whole um, community, is that 90% of all students will be reading at grade level by third grade um, by the June of 2019. They also have goals with each of their grade levels and these were set by the grade level teams when they're looking at their um, data. And so that was an example of something that came out from last year. Um, one of the things before we go on to the, uh, to looking at how, oh wait, it's this, huh? How schools did, uh, there we go, um, is that not only do we look at the lack of growth where we come in and have, where principals come in and they talk to their staff to look at, to, um, where they discuss their plans to address the growth, there's also bright spots that are pulled out. So it's also looking at, wow, look at this school, look at second grade, reading at this school, what is going on in those classrooms, let's have a conversation, because that could be something that we can look at and possibly replicate. So we're, so the data is looked at from both sides as well. Um, before we look at the, um, I wanna get up, but I'm not going to, so okay. So before we look at the, each individual school, what we're gonna look at is the gap closure, which means if you look at the blue line, um, which is a normed growth, say, for a fourth grade reading classroom. In the fall, um, they were sitting about 195.7, and then they grew 5.4 RIT growth points. That was for an at grade level fourth grade, okay, in reading. If we look at the red and orange lines, it's two examples. It's a, of, say, a, a, a school that started about 194, and the orange line, the school grew, their growth was more than the normed, okay? So they grew 6.3 points versus a 5.4. So if you look, the gap is closing. The second example is a school who did not have as much growth as the blue line, so the gap actually widened between fall and winter, okay? So when we go and look at individual schools, what we wanna look at, we're gonna be looking at math and reading for the different grade levels. Um, if the bar is below, it means that they did not grow as much as a grade on track grade level student, 
okay? So that grade. So what we wanna see is we wanna see positive growth, which means they're closing the gap. Additionally, the colors below, the orange um, represents that they are two years behind in grade level as a grade, um, and red means that they're more than two grade levels behind. So if you're at a grade level, second grade, math, you're already two grade levels be behind, you want to increase and have a higher growth rate than what is expected so that you can close the gap. Okay, so this is a messy math and reading. I can do that. Go ahead. Above. That means it's positive and they're closing the gap. They're getting closer to the at grade level. Okay? So they're closing the gap. We want them to have positive growth. So the, the numbers below represent the grade. The colors represent how far below those grade levels are. So second, so for example, um, let's see, let's go fifth grade math on the left-hand side. Okay, you're with me? Okay, so there are, there are two grade levels below. You can stand up. I know, I feel, I feel weird. Okay. So there, there are two grade levels below already in fifth grade math. We want them to have positive growth so they can start decreasing the gap to get closer to at grade level. But in this case, they did not have positive growth. They may had some growth, but not as much as we needed for them to close the gap, to, to get closer to that. So not only are they two grade levels behind, they're falling even further behind. Okay? And Soldo. The yellow represents that they're one grade level behind. Orange represents that grade level is two grade levels behind. And we want positive growth. So if you look at reading for Ann Soldo, they had positive growth, which means that in reading, they're closing the gap in second, third, fourth, and fifth. They're getting closer, and eventually the oranges will turn. To, if they continue this trajectory, then the oranges will turn to yellow, which then they'll turn to green, which means they're on grade level. Okay? Bradley? Their math, they didn't do as well, but if you look at reading, they had positive growth. They really focused on their literacy summits. And so it's showing positive growth in reading across the board. If you have, except for fourth grade, which was, they had the exact same growth as, um, so they, it didn't change the gap. So, so just ahead. so that we, we talk a lot about one year's growth. So what this is saying is anytime it's above the line, that they're making more than one year's growth, right? So we talk about closing the gap and making more than one year's growth. So um, it becomes very important for our students to do that. Calabasas. Calabasas has done um, really focused, and if you go there in terms of their reading and it's showing, even though they are still behind, that they have a lot of catch up to do, but they are making more than a year's growth, which means that if they continue this trajectory, they will catch up in reading. Freedom. H.A. Hyde. Hall District. For the most part, other than two grade levels, Hall District flatlined, which means that, they're, um, that the gap did not widen or decrease. Okay. So they're making a year's growth. Did you want to so we're, we aren't showing it, but what I, what I want you to know is that last year when we looked at the map data at this time, almost all the schools were not making at least one year's growth. So what was happening is before, it was actually in the negatives, meaning that gap was widening. Versus this year, this year what we're seeing is 
really when take reading for Hall, you may be, well, that's not really that great. But in reality, it is because for second, fourth, and fifth, um, not as much for fourth, but definitely second and fifth, they are making exactly one year's growth, which is good, right? We, because our students are behind, we want them to go even further than that, but they're at least making at least one year's growth. So it's not that when we say that they've, they're not, they haven't flatlined in that they haven't made growth, they, they have actually just, they have made one year's growth, but they're not closing the gap. Yes. Landmark. And I, when we meet to look at the data, we're going to go more in depth of looking at how they did the year prior to this year. There has been, like Dr. Rogge said, there has been a lot of growth at the schools. Um, it does look better, definitely looks better than last year. McQuitty. And I'm not sure why some came out blurry. I apologize for that. Um, Mar Vista. So the green means that they're at grade level. Yellow still means they're a year's grade level behind as compared to a nationwide. And then um, the orange is that they are two grade levels behind. Um, and how that is determined in terms of right here, in terms of the grade level, it's looking at they take um, the NWA takes a thousand schools from a pool of 6,000 districts and 23,000 public schools. And that's how it's determined what is grade level. Minty White. So last year, Minty White did not have um, as much, where they were uh, making more than a year's growth. So they've done a great job in the reading and also math. Baloney. Yeah, very focused staff. Um, Eloni, the, the staff, really looks at the data and determines what their next steps are going to be. Radcliffe. Rio. So the purple is the first one. That, this purple color here means that they are um, above, performing above grade level. So not only is the sixth grade above grade level in reading, they're also making, the students are making more than a year's growth in the sixth grade. Starlight, Starlight was um, the only elementary school in the district that had, that's making more than a year's growth in both math and reading um, in all grade levels. So we, um, actually went and talked to the staff and congratulated them and we were really looking at what they're doing on their school site so we can learn from um, what the teachers are doing. What are they doing, Lisa? They're being very strategic with their data and their individual students. Um, they're also goal setting. So every third through fifth, the first between the fall and winter, um, every student um, looked at their map data to figure out where their strengths were, where they needed to improve, and set goals. And um, it showed a tremendous difference, and the students loved it. So now, between winter and the spring, they're including also the second graders. So the second graders are really um, owning their own um, education, their own goals, and their own data. Um, Valencia. So for an example, Valencia, um, I was going to show you one with Valencia is that I believe it is the in the reading in the fourth and fifth grade, they were um, a year below at the fall, but because of the positive growth that they had where they're making more than a year's growth, they're now fourth and fifth grades now at grade level. So that's an example of how it does increase. Yeah. And so, and then if you look, the sixth grade is performing um, in reading above grade level. And then we're going to go on to the middle schools. So we have Aptos Junior. And you can see here they're, again, making good progress in math. Um, good in seventh grade reading, eighth grade kind of flat and a little behind. So teachers are talking 
especially in reading where you have discrepancies like this, they're talking about what are they doing differently with 7th and 8th graders around reading that caused the growth in 7th grade that maybe they're missing in 8th. So it'll help them close the gap moving forward. Next school, Cesar Chavez. You can see they did really, they started to produce some good growth in math in eighth grade, which is a great trend. Pretty flat in sixth and seventh, but again, we're looking at why did that occur versus eighth grade versus the other two grade levels. What happened with the teachers and what was going on in their reading? They did well. They're going in a positive direction, six, seven, and eight in the school, so they're working to close the gap and get students closer to grade level. Um, part of the work with MAP that we're undergoing right now that you'll see in the future is that as we close the gap at elementary, we'll start having cohorts of students that enter sixth grade at grade level. Right now, we have students that enter sixth and enter ninth that are just below grade level. So the work we do and the, and the progress we see in MAP needs to be greater in order to close the gap. But over time, the use of MAP you'll see in our system will cause this trend to change and you'll see kids starting to grow all the way across the board and the gap will start to close for all students. Next one is EA Hall Middle School. Again, EA Hall did well in reading. They're going in the right direction, still flat in math and not seeing the growth we want to see. Lakeview Middle. Lakeview Middle did an excellent job in mathematics. We're seeing great growth in seventh and eighth. Again, teachers are talking about what, what happened with sixth grade. What were they doing differently in sixth grade that wasn't occurring, that did occur in seventh and eighth grade math that caused the growth to occur. Um, they did tremendous in seventh grade reading. Um, and again, the site and the principal and the teachers are talking about why is there this discrepancy? What did they do in seventh grade to cause that kind of growth that's different from what the teachers did in sixth and eighth grade? So these are great conversations and collaborations in order to improve student learning. Next school's Pajaro Middle. Pajaro Middle math is not growing. They actually are just below flat line, so they're not closing the gap right now. But six, seven, and eight, they're showing improvement in reading. So kids are closing the gap and reading at a higher level. Then we go to Rolling Hills, our last school, Rolling Hills. Again, kind of mixed for them. They had good, some positive growth in eighth grade, um, not so much in sixth and seventh with math, but in reading, same thing, sixth and seventh, not as much growth. Similar trend to what happened in math, which is an interesting correlation. And then we had some growth in eighth grade, which was good, so that they we're closing the gap a little bit on reading. What's that? Both in eighth grade, yes. The eighth grade cohort produced and showed more growth. So as we continue with using MAP and utilizing the tools and getting students to do goal setting and teachers to use the data, remember this is our fifth administration of the test. So we're learning as we go, but it's, I'm excited to see what we're seeing because we're seeing better growth this year than we did last. And we're seeing the gap close this year better than it did last year. So we're K-12 going in the right direction. I don't have high school right now because they just finished up. They test later for their second administration. So I'll bring that data back to you probably at the time we have our conversation about student growth and data. And as we're getting more proficient with the, um, with the NWA map, one of the things is everybody is learning together. Um, some are in different parts of the spectrum, which includes teachers. There's very powerful tools on there where it allows teachers to differentiate instruction for students based on where they are because of each individual student's test scores. Last year, as we're rolling it out and teachers just becoming familiar with it and um, administrators, the, as many tools were not utilized. And as we're getting better with the goal setting and differentiation, the um, positive um, scores will continue to increase. Um, the main, um, I think one of the main features of the programs that we really want not only um, the students to own their data, but also the teachers to utilize the data to provide the differentiated instruction within the classroom because it is real time and it's not the, um, like the cast at the end of the year. So the final process step is that students do take the, the, the um, test again in the spring. And so we look at growth for the entire year to see um, the students if they're making a, at least a year's growth. 
And then based on that information, as well as different assessments that um, are used on the school site, um, the principals come in and we have um, a discussion on the goal attainment, so the goals that they set at the beginning of the year and possibly the correct mid-year correction that they did on the summit number two. We look at whether the goal attainment ha um, occurred for their um, ELA and their math. We um, review the mid-summit action plan um, and then the f reflection of the instructional practices that happen inside the classroom and their focus for the school. So at the beginning of the year, each admin administration should have instructional goals and focus and keep that focus. So we talk about whether we believe that those instructional practices worked or they didn't work or what needs to change and um, how often and what type of da data was uh, presented to the staff and how much have the, did the staff have the buy-in or was it just the administration team? What we like to see is that we find that schools that do better includes the entire community, which are all the teachers, so that everybody can talk about what's happening inside the classroom. And then we start looking at planning for the following year on what the goal should be and what um, changes in instructional practices. And so that is the end. Thank you very much. Um, are there any speakers? There is not. Okay. Um, questions, comments from the board? It's pretty Kim? I saw you writing notes furiously. <laughs> if you don't have anything, that's okay. So as administrators who have seen many models of uh, assessment, I know that, I think, Mark, you, this, I don't know if it was your idea or Susan's idea, somebody brought this here. Um, are, do, are, as a team, are you feeling like this is a successful assessment tool and helpful to school staff? I say absolutely. Um, I've had experience with it as well. I'll, I'll pass it on is because not only does it give this, you can um, do goal setting with students, and students have the information, parents have the information, teachers can use it to differentiate within the classroom, and it gives the teacher the idea um, um, where the student really understand where their students are in terms of their math and their reading scores. And are teachers open to um, to looking at this and and really? understanding because I mean I have to say it is a little bit hard to wrap my brain around yeah the gap we, and the you know as we move along teachers are learning we're yeah. they're learning together with their site administrators it's a new tool um, it's a tool I used in the past in school districts I worked in for many years and it can produce phenomenal results I believe once we get better at learning together about how to use those tools and the goal setting and what RIT scores mean and how to interpret that data we will see that same growth in this district. One of the things that I worry about is it seems like it's normed, I don't know if that's the right word, against a, a national um, school system that is completely inequitable in terms of funding, right? So California is 46th in the nation for per pupil funding, and yet we're being, these kids are being held to, um, held against other kids that maybe have double the amount of money that we get to, to educate them. So I'm just curious, is there, do, is there a way to, to extrapolate the data just against schools in California that are similar, or do we, they always are normed against these schools nationwide? I'm not sure we can look into whether there is um, a way to extrapolate the data, but one thing that we do know is there's a strong correlation between CAFs CASP scores at the end of the year and how students perform. The second thing is, is that when our students are graduating from high school, they're placed up against the same students nationwide when they go to college. And so we got to make sure that they are prepared as just as any other student across the nation. Um, I was just going to say, um, I really think the whole idea of the student involvement in, in this map, um, students just looking how they're doing, making goals for themselves. I mean, what you were saying, I forgot what school that was that did that. Um, Starlight. Starlight. I think it was Starlight. Starlight. I was, I'm so pro having students involved, you know, in their own scores and thinking about them. So I think student involvement throughout the whole district is, I think that's pretty great and it would be wonderful that 
students could be more involved in their own assessments and thinking about them and what they want to do, you know, to make a difference for themselves. I like that. <laughs> Really? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Superintendent, what, what do you need from the board to continue the process? Is there anything that you can think of? Um, I just say time, right? Um, I think that we made great progress. Um, we're, we, we didn't show it tonight um, just because it, it becomes a little confusing, so we wanted to do it in the special board study session on April 11th instead. But um, if you look at the growth that occurred last year versus the growth that occurred this year, we've like tripled the growth. We literally, the gap was widening for almost every single school last year because we weren't on track to make one year's growth. This year, not only do we have a lot of schools making at least one year's growth, but you saw how many schools were making way over one year's growth. Um, you know, we're gonna look at more than just MAP on the 11th, we're gonna look at for other measures, um, whether it's ACT, um, um, SAT scores, we're gonna also be looking at Fontes and Pinnell scores in our, our performance task. So we'll be looking at a little bit more data, but um, you know, we have to implement we have to monitor and we have to iterate and make sure we continue to make changes. Um, I am proud of all the staff for the work that they're doing. I think you saw by how many schools have above. It's not easy to make one year's growth. It seems like it would be, but we have fragile student populations and so it's not always easy to make one year's growth. And they're not only doing that, but they're beating the odds, right? They're making more than one year's growth and that's what we need for our students. So I think, I know you, you've, there's a sense of impatience. Um, the directors out there will say, yeah, Michelle's impatient as can be, um, because I feel a huge sense of urgency as well. But we have to, I, I cannot um, change what has happened in the last five, eight years. I can only change what's happening now. And we've implemented a lot of great programs this year and a lot of great work. And our teachers have taken it on and it's shown in the data. So we just need to celebrate that and continue to focus. I think the instructional cycle is important because it includes every one of us, whether it's the directors that are out here or the principals or the students themselves. Um, we, we're trying to get everybody involved in looking at the data all of the time. Um, is there any collaboration happening between um, schools and their feeder schools? Yeah, so what, and it was kind of mentioned in the summits, but what we've started to do is to have, especially for the second summit, they're not doing it originally. The summits were done um, really one by one, and now they're done in small pods and clusters where they're really able to build best practices within each other. Um, we are not doing, because right now we're focusing mostly on, um, on horizontal, um, you know, articulation, so, sec you know, elementary across the districts and not as much on the vertical, um, but we will definitely get there. Right now we're, you know, I, I have the belief that we can only focus on so much at a time. So right now we're really focusing on best practices and getting these, co these cohorts together to learn from each other within elementary, middle, and high. Um, eventually we will definitely do vertical articulation. And is there a way that we can get data um, that's directly associated with our English language learners Certainly. and special ed? Because I think that will be helpful just to get a better understanding of how their students are doing and what we can do. Sure, we'll definitely include that on April 11th. We'll talk specifically about their growth. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, I know, I remember last year, um, either you told us as a board or in the one-on-one -on -one with me that this was your goal, was to get um, every school have one year's growth. And I know that we're well on our way there. And I'm glad that we did this presentation today for the, the public, Bill. Because <laughs> I'm not just Bill. But he had, this was, uh, <laughs> did a, 
um, a member of the public gave us a presentation that we should be holding uh, people accountable and ourselves from the board all the way down to the classroom. I think we're all accountable, so this is exciting news. So thank you. So that was a report and discussion item. No action was necessary. Um, so we'll move on to, thank you for the report, all of you. Um, we'll move on to item 11, our consent agenda. Uh, do 10.2. 10 10 oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> I've been sitting here looking at it. I'm so ready for you to come up here. That's I guess totally I'm getting tired. Okay. This is a right um, report from Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. I'm, e I'm even more embarrassed because I'm actually on that board as well. <laughs> so I'm sorry. It's totally okay. It's Thank too you cold in here. <laughs> So uh, good evening, uh, President DeRose, members of the board, staff, and few community members uh, that are still here. Uh, my name is Erica Padilla-Chavez, and I'm the CEO of Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. And joining me is um, one of our fearless leaders uh, at PVPSA, Joaquin Castillo, who is the Tobacco Use Prevention Education Coordinator for PVPSA, who works hand in hand with many of your educators. Um, across the m multiple schools. Next slide. Can you, can you click for me? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so we're here to talk to you about the California Healthy Kids Survey, also known as CHICS. So I will actually be referencing it that way through this presentation. So let me just give you an overview of what the CHICS is. Um, it is the largest state, statewide survey that measures protective <coughs> factors in school climate. It is a student survey. So students are the um, uh, participants in the survey. It assesses various topics that relate to students' health <coughs> behaviors um, and academic performance. It is used by state and local policymakers to advance school uh, improvement efforts. And for school districts, um, it, is often, um, it often provides data that can be used for programmatic planning. Um, at PVPSA, we like to reference the chicks also for our own programmatic efforts. So what is our role at PVPSA? Um, for many, many years now, we've been the administrator for the district of the Tobacco Use Prevention Education Curriculum. It is an evidence-based curriculum that gets administered at middle and high schools. Am I, is it middle and high school? Middle and high schools. Um, we are also responsible for administering the chicks um, when in every other year the chicks gets uh, surveyed uh, students get surveyed every other year so this year we're off the data that you're going to be seeing is 16 17 data next time we'll do this will be 18 19 the chicks data actually has some great data that correlates to goal six of your LCAP um, which is your pro promotion of safe, supportive, and positive school environments. So again, these are what students are saying about those environments. You'll get to see some data around that. Um, we also do act as liaisons with West Ed, which is a statewide administrator for chicks, um, and we make sure that those reports get to you. Um, next slide. So we survey fifth graders, seventh graders, ninth graders, and 11th graders. These are the four grades that get surveyed um, every other year. Um, these are known as major transition years. You were supposed to do this, huh, Joaquin? I'm gonna go ahead and finish it. I'm just too cold. Um, and uh, it's important to note that uh, there's a particular reason for why these years were selected. Um, one thing I will let you know is that the module, next slide, Joaquin, the modules um, for elementary uh, grades, which is your fifth graders, and your secondary module, which encompasses your middle and high school grades, um, measure similar components. The only thing that's a bit different is mental, mental health and physical health assessment. We don't necessarily measure that for fifth graders. It has to do with the relevancy or the age appropriateness of the questions that are in the survey. Um, for example, uh, suicidality is one particular question that is asked of your middle and high school students. We don't ask that for fifth graders. Nevertheless, every fifth grader that participates does require a parental uh, permission slip to be signed for them to participate. So this is who participated. I just want to sh uh, walk you through the colors. The dark purple represents the most current cohort of students who responded to the chicks. 
Um, last time we did this was 1415, uh, so you have comparative data there. The NT on your lower um, left uh, uh, corner there represents our alternative schools. Um, NT stands for non-traditional schools. So this is the first year that we actually um, were uh, inclusive of the Renaissance uh, commun uh, Community Day School um, and those types of school. We want to continue to include them for future years. So you will see a lot of single bars for the NT, but I think it's important for you to see that. Uh, cumulatively, we had 3,708 students who participated this year as compared to 3,520 last time. For today's presentation and discussion, these are the four areas that we're gonna share with you. Uh, we're gonna share with you the data um, pertaining to school connectedness. How did students perceive themselves connected to their school environment? We're gonna walk you through school safety and substance abuse data. Cigarette use, of course, because this funding, uh, the TUPA funding supports the Chicks administration and mental health. So on school connectedness, um, I do want to share with you that for purposes of comparison, we included the county average data um, there. So the gray bar represents the data as a whole for the county. So in the school connectedness category, you will note slight variation, variations both up and down between the last administered survey of 1415 to the most current 1617. The most notable change that we picked up is um, in the ninth graders. Ninth graders, this particular cohort of, of respondents felt 10% more connected to their school than the ninth grade cohort did a couple years ago. Similarly, 11th graders felt 8% more connected than their, uh, the prior cohort that took this, this uh, survey. Questions in this area um, included questions such as, I feel um, questions regarding why they tend to miss school, questions regarding why they tend to cut class, if they do cut class, questions regarding um, qualifying statements such as, I feel a part of the school community, yes, I do, or no, I don't. Um, teachers in the school communicate with my parents about my expectations, yes, they do, or no, they don't. If I, I try hard to do good in school because I'm interested in my work, yes, I do, or no, I don't. And so they self-evaluated self themselves and essentially um, all of these uh, uh, questions uh, result to the school connectedness um, assessment. Next slide. And I can, if I could just add a comment on that. The reason why school connectedness is so important, if you look at any, uh, if you look at any evidence-based program, the, one of the biggest predictors of if that program would actually be successful is how connected the students feel to their school as well as how connected the staff and the stu uh, feels to the students and their, their administration. School safety. In the school safety category, you will see also slight variations, both up and down between each year, uh, between the, the grades. In this case, we want to see, of course, uh, the bar go up. Seventh graders were the only group of respondents that felt that the school was a little less safe this particular time around. Um, a keynote here to see, though, is it's interesting to see how the pattern tends to kind of curve down as you get, get into your freshman year, and we were kind of hypothesizing, well, why is that? Why is that that that's happening? Perhaps it's that they are not assessing themselves a sense of authority at the new school, right? And that then weighs into the types of uh, responses that they give to the survey. But you do see somewhat of a pattern there. Some of the questions that get asked in this category um, include a question such as, during the past 12 months, how many times on school property, have you been made fun of because of your looks? Have you been afraid of being beaten up? Have you been threatened with harm or injury? And there's about 30 questions like that that um, comprise this particular component. So it's really the student's perception of safety in relationship to their engagement with other peers and other adults, adults on campus. Next slide. Uh, so for this slide, we wanted to see uh, of the substance abuse of al alcohol and other drug use. So we have all the grades here. We also have the county data to compare. We don't have that for fifth grade because the county didn't take uh, that data. So we do see that the highest is here, the fifth graders. 
uh, which might seem a little scary, but uh, one, uh, one thing to note there is the sixth, uh, fifth graders were asked if they had uh, consumed any uh, alcohol or other drugs, not only at schools, but as well as outside the school. So for the other seventh, ninth, eleventh grade, they were asked if they consumed alcohol in school. And even, even then, we, we are seeing a, a decrease in every, or almost every area, even if it's small, uh, uh, 1%, which we still think that's very valuable. Now, what we do see our biggest uh, substance abuse is in our uh, alternative schools, like Erica mentioned, it's, that's up to 43. Now, while that is high, it's still uh, sort of, compared to the county, it's still right at, at the average. But we do at PBPSA take that very seriously, and we are implementing and adding more services to those schools, not only in AOE, but as well as preventive. Uh, we, we are big believers in prevention. You know, it's cheaper to do prevention than work after the fact, and we are uh, working on that as well. And as far as uh, cigarettes, as Erica mentioned, this is funded through tobacco youth prevention, so uh, through TUPE. And what we're seeing here is, as well as an increase, even though we're uh, a, a decrease in fifth grade, and we see an increase in seventh, ninth, eleventh grade, and we see a big use here. And one of the reasons for that, it might not be just tobacco use of cigarettes with the big um, sort of uh, popularity of electronic cigarettes being implemented, and we know that's not just uh, tobacco or, or nicotine. We know that it's other substances as well. That's what we're seeing, sort of that increase there. But we are. Uh, big believers in PUPSA of not only addressing this as well as fighting the, the normalization of, of tobacco or nicotine use again. Um, and and we, we do that not only through prevention, we also do that through policy work that we do working uh, with our local governments on that. And then the last topic we wanted to share with you is mental health. And this particular category speaks to a lot of the work as we, substance abuse use does for PVPSA. But in this particular category, the question that students get, get asked is the following. During the past 12 months, did you ever feel so sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks, two weeks or more, that you stopped doing some usual activities? So persistence of sadness and hopelessness for at least two weeks is what the students are responding. And so you'll see that um, in seventh grade, you did see a little bit of an increase from between um, this cohort and the prior cohort. You can see how we compare to the county for that particular grade. Um, you see that for all the other grades, we tend to have improved um, a sense of um, happiness, I guess, would be the, the um, opposite of hopelessness and sadness. Um, but we take this particular data very seriously at PVPSA. It actually guides our um, implementation of where we need to focus, where we need to deploy additional counselors, um, what grades are the grades that need additional supports. So um, activities such as what you are doing and you have done, adding those social emotional counselors to, to the various school sites, those are all great initiatives that help address in particular this, this component. Um, we've been able to ensure that we have a Kids Corner counselor at every school, that we're um, leveraging additional resources to bring in more therapeutic care. Because really, if you think about what this slide is saying, a quarter of each group of students that answered in each group had, is saying, hey, there are times where all I'm worried about is my emotional state. That's all I am worried about. So for us, that means they may not be paying attention to the teacher. And on the one hand, you're, the teacher is putting everything they have. On the other hand, the child has triggers that is um, causing them to not be able to pay attention to what is happening. So at PVPSA, we always say our job is to help these kids get to a place where they can go into a classroom and learn. And we do that by, by addressing those, those issues that are causing some of this sadness or hopelessness. And that concludes our presentation. Any questions? Thank you, Erica. So we don't have speakers to this item. Um, so I will ask if any board members have questions or comments. Karen? <laughs> will it? Well, I, I, was, I, I remember in the mental health issue, it did ask you, are, have you considered, 
don't know if it said if you considered suicide or if you felt suicidal. I'm not sure how it said that. But um, there was that question about that. And like, and, and when I was looking at the diagrams, it made me feel like, oh my gosh, I hope these kids, yeah, yikes. <laughs> So you'll be, so suicidality is one of these sub-questions that feeds up to this particular category. And um, I'm happy to report that the number of respondents in that particular category as compared to state and even our county one data is really insignificant. I mean, we are half of what the, the county reports. I think 10% of our students reported at one point feeling um, some level of suicidality as compared to 23% in the county. Oh, it's wow. much larger for, for the state of California. Wow. So, well, I was looking so, at, yeah. So while there's a sense of sadness and hopelessness, um, it, it's, it tends to be at a point where we can manage it, um, and it's not necessarily escalating um, to a more, you know, uh, 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 egregious situation. Yeah, suicidal kind of thing. <laughs> right. Well, I, th I saw the difference between um, the alternative schools and here, like, whoa, you're talking about way over 20% difference, like, just gigantic. And you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure what to attribute that to, but one thing I can tell you that I hear frequently from staff that are assigned at these schools is the level of familial interaction that staff have with the students of these, at these school sites. There seems to be deep relationships at these school sites. Um, there's a, 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 almost a, um, over focus and making sure that every student is feeling welcome at these school sites. So I think the staff is doing a fabulous job in making sure that those students that are going to these alternative school sites are feeling connected, are feeling wanted and welcomed at these school sites. No, I, I, I'm absolutely sure that's because people feel like they really like their teachers at Renaissance and they're kind of the teachers at Renaissance are kind of counselors too. They're teachers and counselors there. You know what I'm saying? So. They're really there for the students. And of course, the classes sizes are smaller, and so they can really be there for them there, too. And then, you know, I know the teachers are really there for the kids at, for example, new school, like 24-7. I mean, students can call them at any time of day or night, pretty much, and the teachers, you know, are there for them. So, yeah, there's a really wonderful connection we have here with alternative schools and the and the teacher and staff, yeah, it's really, yeah. it's great, yeah. Okay, Karen, thank, thank you. you, Willie. Thank you. Thank you. Erica, the um, tragedy in Florida, a lot of the, lot of the um, comments coming out now are centered around mental health. Is there, is there a way that you guys can work with all of the other agencies to um, translate these numbers down to a down to a youngster and um, help or pinpoint that one person that might you know do something so uh, we have we have a lot of agencies is is there a plan to work with everybody to, to maybe to. prevent this from happening huh. Well, you know, we work really hard, which is why we, we are so focused and started in the early years. Uh, prevention's in our name, so we try to ensure that we're preventing um, any child from falling behind in any way, shape, or form. Um, why our Kids Corner program is so popular is because, one, we're, we're making ourselves accessible, irregardless of pay or source, for students who perhaps a teacher is signaling some issues that need some attention and some assessment, there's a counselor there that's able to, to assess and determine um, whether or not the child needs uh, more in-depth care um, and address. So Willie, the truth is that I'm not sure that we're ever going to be to, able to say, oh, well, this will never happen again through mental health care, right? But what I can tell you is that PVUSD is doing it right. There are a lot of school districts that don't have the model uh, that we have here at Pajaro Valley Unified School District, where there is an embedded school mental health practitioner, and then you add the social emotional counselors that you have brought on board. You have layers of support that a lot of school districts don't. 
Um, so, and I can say that from having worked at many school districts where this model is atypical. You, this is not a model that you see frequently in other school districts across the state of California, and I would bet the nation for that matter. So, you, yeah, so we're on to something. Okay, so if, if uh, Suzanne brings, brings to the board a youngster for expulsion, have, have, have you already worked with her on possible preventive solutions and what's happening? Probably, and if they've come to you, it's because we've exhausted every possible resource and we haven't been able to either get through the child or get to the family or get some sort of behavioral change. Um, but my bet is that yes, there was probably a conversation. I'm sure there are certain incidents that um, require strict discipline. Um, and in those cases, that's really, I think, more regulatory um, issues that you, Suzanne and her team have to take into account. But for the most part, our attempt and our whole goal is to try to keep the kids in, within the school district learning um, and get them to graduate. At the end of the day, that's what our goal is. But if it, if it happens to be that a youth comes to you, it's probably because we've tried um, the different modalities of, of, of care that we, we make available to students. What, what uh, plans, if, if any, are, are there for mental health um, programs to be expanded? Ah, yeah. great question. So um, you probably know that PVPSA is um, kind of in a footprint expansion mode. We're doing that because we do need more therapists. We're busting at the seams. Um, we're making do with what we have. Um, we are interested in expanding our substance abuse program. We're actually right now um, in the process of, of uh, seeking state approval to launch our drug medical program, which will allow for us to almost triple the amount of substance abuse counselors that we're making available to the school district. One thing we know for sure is that sometimes substance abuse is correlated with mental health issues. Substance abuse can be a form of self-medication. Um, and so more and more data is starting to come out that when a, a young person or an adult has an issue with substances, one must assess their mental health situation because perhaps they've been self-medicating to try to address the behavioral issues that are impacting their lives. So you saw the data on substance abuse and you saw where we are seeing some, some need for attention. Our interest is in expanding that particular program to address that particular need because we are seeing data that we want to see the, go the opposite yes. way. Okay. Uh I, I, uh, I think that you guys are doing a great job, and, and I think that we have to have also a lot of agencies um, doing, doing a fine, fine job. What, I, what I'd like to recommend is a uh, study session for one night trying to bring everything together so that we, we all know what's going on. And, and we uh, tried, tried this a couple of years ago, but I, but I think we need to keep working on on that just as a reminder to everyone that uh, we we uh, have the services uh, and um, maybe should even try to expand some of those services I don't know but um, maybe we can have a special uh, a, a study session just on that sure okay thank you very much thank, thank you thank you thank you, thank you. A, a couple of questions if I may um, so to your last point, Erica, I just find it interesting how um, they're using the substance abuse to medicate themselves. And that's usually correlated, like you said, with some sort of mental health issue. So I'm actually surprised that the survey doesn't allow fifth graders to participate in that section. So is there a talk about possibly modifying that part of the survey to fit fifth graders? Because those numbers were shocking to me. Yeah. And we know that by the time they hit seventh grade, those numbers are looking probably far worse. Yeah. So one thing that um, the question for fifth graders asked um, around alcohol, um, have you had a sip here and there at home? Um, and, and we know 
that um, a lot of the young people who come across our doors who are fifth graders or even younger sometimes that um, have, uh, you know, t either taken a drink of alcohol or are using alcohol, it started at home. Um, so there's definitely some education and work that we're continuously doing to bring in the parents to make them understand that perhaps uh, some ill-perceived notion that it's okay to share a little bit of a beer uh, with your child um, is not dangerous, to co correct rectify that and correct that. Um, one thing I can tell you, uh, Trustee Orozco, is that the school district can add any question to any of the modules. Um, we have to do it six months before we administer the test so that we can allow West Ed to shape the module for your particular school district. Um, we've sat down with Suzanne already to begin some preliminary discussions about questions that could help with other LCAP cap areas. Um, so that you can begin to use this tool that gets administered every other year. It's paid for through Tupe. It's not even having to come out of your, your budget. Um, so that you can use that data. So as long as the school district states this is what we want to survey, then we can include that. This particular template was a template that is administered across the state. But again, you have the right to add questions if you so want to. And I would just need to know probably within the next month or two so that we can um, put that in the queue and get that ready to West Ed. Thank you, and the other thing I just wanted to pinpoint, it's, it seems to me that there's also a trend. So we always see those numbers worse than for seventh graders, like that area. Mm -hmm. So I think that that should, it should serve as an indicator for us as board members to really take a, a solid look at really what's going on and what services are needed for that specific population, if not earlier. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to intervene, right, than prevention. Right. right. I'm going to be very curious to see what the 1819 data is like, because I think that'll be the year where you will get to see the impact of the social emotional counselors in some of these questions, um, because they will have been there, what, three years now, four years? About so, about that. So, you know, I'm interested in seeing, because these questions really do correlate to a lot of the work that these social emotional counselors are doing. But thank you for that question. Hi there. Hi. Thank you for presenting the data. I think um, I loved how you talked about that this data will drive some of your decision making about where to expand, where to put in extra help. Um, as a mental health professional myself, certified in pediatrics, um, I know how important this all is. I want to commend um, PBPSA um, for your amazing uh, successes in recent couple of years in procuring um, monies and grants to expand the services to the communities of the Pajaro Valley. It's been very, very exciting, and we're very pleased, I think, as a board and as an administration, you all speak for them that we can provide these extra services, not only to the kids in our district, but to their families, because it sounds like that's happening too. Um, so I also serve on a board called ETR, mm -hmm. and we're having um, one of our uh, quarterly board meetings tomorrow. If there's anything that you are interested in, in terms of curriculum development in any area that you'd like to give me feedback on, I could bring it directly to the people doing the research there, so. Um, well. I Funny you would, you would um, offer because one uh, particular pilot initiative that we are working on at Lakeview Middle School is a trauma-informed culture of care at that site. It's funded through a Kaiser grant that we received. And what we are doing is we're working with the administrative team there. Um, Suzanne is involved in that um, uh, work group as well to try to see if we can identify a model of care that deal addresses the trauma not just among the students but also your teaching community um, and we're uh, one of 16 schools in Northern California that Kaiser has funded for this initiative our goal is to use the next two years to really study and implement um, practices that we think could address uh, the underlying causes of behavioral health issues, which is often trauma-related. Somebody suffered something when they were young and never addressed it. Um, 
or a, as an adult, our own trauma can sometimes um, impact how we carry ourselves in the classroom or with other peers. Uh, to address that so that we can bring it to you as a board and, sh and share with you, these are our learning lessons at Lakeview. These are some of the promising practices that we have discovered that could be effective in other middle schools um, in your school district. So there's all these little special initiatives that we get to work with your um, administrative teams at various school sites. This particular one is very special to me um, because um, as we have been working with the youth the last couple of years, trauma seems to be the underlying reason for uh, a lot of these behavioral outbursts that we are seeing. Unresolved issues um, that are manifesting themselves in ways that um, could have been prevented. Uh, so we're, we're really, really focused in, in addressing the trauma situation with our children and, and really um, as a society. Yeah. Okay, thank you. thank you, Kim. Thank you, Erica. Um, so I recall that um, it was one of these survey reports that, um, that really got the board discussing and moving forward with, with implementing the social social emotional counselors at the middle school level because I'm sure everybody noticed seventh grade is when these problems peak. And uh, for those of us who have had kids that have gone through middle school, you know, um, I've seen it first. We ourselves. Yes, we <laughs> ourselves, absolutely. Let's not go there. Um, anyway, um, so I, I think this is so um, valuable. I, I just can't say how valuable it is. And, and I'm glad to know that we can um, submit suggestions for um, new questions and and really to build on that I started thinking about how the tr when it comes to substance abuse how um, how things change on what what kids are I mean look at we're talking Tide Pods now um, so you go back way back in the day it was whipped cream um, all sorts of things so if you haven't already, I would suggest that we have start that conversation with our local law enforcement to see what are they using? What, what is coming up? What are they using? So we can start to ask those questions in the survey. Have you ever used a household product to get high? Things like that so we can get ahead of it or at least right there when it's, go ahead. So we, we do at PUPSA, when we go into the schools to do our prevention programs, we do our own small survey. We have to do it related to tobacco, where we expand it a little more. And what we see is the vaping products and the marijuana products, there's sort of a resistance to, um, even before the lessons, we do a pre-survey. You know, we ask a question like, marijuana is safe to use because it is natural. So we see a lot of true. And then when we go to the post-survey, they don't go to false, they go to I don't know. There's a resistance of actually you know, recognizing the potential health issues with tobacco, with, I'm sorry, with marijuana. Uh, a lot of the times it's marijuana and tobacco that sometimes they're, they're smoking blunts, which is also tobacco, and they don't recognize that they're actually consuming tobacco and nicotine, as well as the vape pens is where you've seen the biggest uh, increases, at least uh, in the schools that we've uh, surveyed. Okay, so um, I'm glad you brought up marijuana or cannabis because now that's a whole new, I mean, it's not new, but the availability is new. The status in our community is new. So I think um, really getting ahead of that also, I mean, we've seen <laughs> since medical marijuana was uh, legalized, we've seen the overdoses with eating edibles. Edibles, um, I was going to say schools. edibles happening a Right, lot, so yeah. now, I mean, you know, questions like, you know, do you feel like it's okay now just because it's legal while well, it's still and my altering drug. So anyway, I think there's, it's great, but I, I think um, we need to look ahead and really start addressing issues that we see coming down the pike with the help of our police. Um, also, um, your work with our um, uh, student services department uh, is the reason why we have been able to reduce our expulsions by I think it's 50 or 60 percent over the last few years and that is huge that is something that um, we are so proud of the work that you're all doing together and we talk about it all the time go ahead thank you I wanted to share with you that tomorrow I'm meeting with Sheriff Bernal who is the, um, I guess, the chief uh, for the Pajaro Las Lomas area because we know that we have a lot of students 
who um, live in that area. And um, one of the things that we, um, by looking at our internal data, data, we realized that really we have no idea what happens to a high schooler or a middle schooler if he's picked up by the Monterey County Sheriff and then is dealing with the Monterey County juvenile justice system. We have absolutely no way of reaching that student. We do well in the Santa Cruz County side because of the partnership with Suzanne and our partnership with Watsonville PD and our partnership with Santa Cruz Probation. So we've been flagging this for, for a couple of months and tomorrow we'll have a meeting with the sheriff to begin the discussion of having the County of Monterey also participate with Suzanne's team, also participate with PVPSA to take care of that, that large um, student population that we have over in that side of, of, of the river as well. Great, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, is there, are there any other comments? Karen? Uh, I, was, I was just gonna say, um, you know, having um, social emotional counselors in the elementary school is pretty new, so it will be really interesting to find if having them, you know, at the younger ages has, is making, you know, a, a difference for um, children in this case um, and their feelings about, you know, themselves and feelings about their peers and feelings about whatever, their teachers, whatever. Um, so that, that's something we don't, you know, it's kind of new, that part's, that's f fairly new, the social emotional counselors that we have at the elementary school level. So, yeah, I'm interesting to f I'm interested in figuring out how that's you know what differences we can see in the future with that, right? Mm. I'll just say one more comment. I think we're seeing the the difference in the data because we saw it up here for like 43 percent of the county of kids say that they're feeling depressed more than two weeks and. We're down in the 20s, right. so we're doing. You're doing a great job. It's incremental and, change, right. right? And by the way, my cousin is Steve Brunel. So if oh. you have any, <laughs> thank you for letting problem, me know that. If you need help, I can help there. That's wonderful. Uh, awesome. Thank, thank you very you. much, Erica, and thank you for staying late. We appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. So. Um, now we will go to the consent agenda, item 11. Hey. And um, if uh, anyone has a motion to approve the consent agenda, I would like to just make mention um, of gratitude um, on, and I don't think I need to pull this to do this, 11.29, uh, the donation of $10,000 to the Hall Elementary School Library from Rita Tuzong, I guess you say. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I just wanted to make mention of that and I will entertain a motion. I'd, I'd like to defer. Oh, hold on. Hold on. I can't hear what you're saying. There's another donation. Is there another donation? Thank you. Let me get back there. If there were teachers, I was going to. 11.3, another $10,000 donation to Bradley Elementary School from Driscoll's on behalf of the Adopt a School program. So thank you for both of those donations. And go ahead. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, defer item 11.24, which is the uh, Radcliffe School Safety Fence. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as would you like to make a motion with that? I would like to make the motion to approve the consent, uh, deferring item 11.24, okay. and um, a special recognition to uh, 11.3, and the other 11.29. Um, 11.29. Okay. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 502. And now to deferred consent items. And that was 11.24. 11 11 so I just want to make a comment before we vote on this. Uh, it was only just, just a, a couple of weeks ago that uh, Bill Beecher and I, as uh, president, as the chairman of the Bond Oversight Committee, uh, went on a uh, tour of, Rad, of Radcliffe School, and the uh, concern there was the um, homeless uh, people that were camping out around the school, 
and we suggested that a, a fence be uh, built and I'm and I'm just really happy to see the reaction has been fast and and, and it's on the agenda tonight to approve the um, architectural amendment for this for the school safety and I just want to make a special note of this because sometimes you uh, make a comment concern nothing happens so Victor Sandoval who is our uh, our facilities manager is here tonight and I and I and I just want to give a um, recognition to Victor and the uh, superintendent for um, working on this and uh, supporting this right away because the safety issue is uh, is uh, so important. Thank you. And with that, I, I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, 11.24. And is there a second? I'll second. Okay, and before I call for the vote, I just want to um, second what Willie said. I see a trend of um, this just, this district really jumping on items that um, really focus on student safety, and that is the priority, and I'm really, really pleased to see that. So thank you to the administration, including Victor, um, and everybody who um, has taken that charge that student safety's gotta be first. So um, with that, I will call for um, a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five, Zero two. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry. Four zero three. One two. Four zero one two. I didn't notice you. Got that. Four zero three. Okay, um, we do not have to reconvene closed session. We were able to get um, all of our items completed, so we don't have to visit item 13. Item 14 is action on closed session, and that will, will be um, start with expulsions, and Trustee Osmondson um, has agreed to read those out for us. I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of 2016-2017 school year for 17-18-021. Is there a second? second? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 502. I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a full expulsion for the remainder of the 2017-2018 school year for 17-18-023. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 502. I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of 2017-2018 school year for 17-18-024. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 502. And um, Maria is going to read out the remaining items. So under item 2.2, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration with the addition of nine separations and two retirements. And is there a second? Second. second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 502. Five under item 2.3, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration with the addition of three promotions, five new hires, and one separation. And second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Item passes 502. Can we this out? Get your hand here. Sorry, you second. You second. I just told her you did because. Under item 
Um, there was a separation settlement agreement for classify employee uh, number 3052, and it was approved at, during closed session by a 502 vote. Under that same item, um, a separation settlement agreement for classify employee number 4247 was approved with a 502 vote. And that's all for closed session. Our next meeting is next week, so two back to back, and that will be, is that back at City Council Chambers? So that will be at the Watsonville City Council Chambers, um, and I believe we are scheduled to be there through the end of the academic year. Um, and President Lewis, do you want yes. to speak to the special board study session on April 11th yet? Do you want to vote on that yet and speak to that, or do you want to do that next week? Um, Next week. Okay. Okay. So um, we are talking about a special um, study session um, in April that we'll address on next week's agenda. And um, so regular board meeting February 28th. Following that is March 14th is the approval of our second interim report. And um, with that, I will adjourn tonight's meeting. Thank you. <laughs>